Um, and I'll, I'm really looking forward to this next uh, segment. It's my pleasure uh, to sit down today with an, interviewer, inter an innovator and an entrepreneur who is really doing some revolutionary stuff in healthcare. Uh, her company is 23andMe. Um, this, of course, is Ann Wyshicki. Um, Ann uh, founded the company in 2006, just three years after the human genome was sequenced. Uh, she had, before that, she had been uh, working on Wall Street where she saw people doing, um, in healthcare and Wall Street where she saw people, quote, monetizing illness. Uh, she spent a decade there, and uh, after that time, she felt frustration, felt like she wanted to do something that was incentivizing um, prevention instead of just treating illness, and she wanted to flip that model on its head. So Anne focused on empowering people with direct access to their own genetic information so they could use that data to make decisions that could you know, lower their own risks for disease. Um, and so, Anne, please, welcome. Thank you. Hello, I think I've spoken to your, your mother and your sister Susan before, but this is the first time, so I'm really happy to uh, be talking to you today. But I'm hoping you can maybe tell me a little bit about how you got from uh, Wall Street to 23andMe. How did, what was it about, uh, how did monetizing illness inspire uh, your company? Well, um, you know, I, I set out to join, like I ended up in Wall Street very randomly. Like I didn't, I come from an academic background. I always wanted to be a doctor. Um, and so it was totally random. Like I didn't set out because I was like, oh, I want to go and make lots of money on Wall Street. Um, but I found it was like, it was just a phenomenal education. It was so interesting. And, um, you know, as I learned more and more, and I also, my sister is an epidemiologist. She studies obesity. I kind of found that we could give this, this, um, this talk in tandem where she would give this talk about the crisis of obesity. Like it's a problem, like, you know, the, like all of the costs that are coming, like you get diabetes and heart disease and, you know, um, like, you know, renal failure, like everything, like she could go and give this talk. And then I would give the corollary talk that was like obesity, the ultimate money maker. And, <laughs> and so I, I started to feel like, you know, there was something wrong. <laughs> and I actually love pointing out to public health people now that you can buy an obesity ETF. Like, there's all kinds of ways you can monetize obesity. Like, people yeah. don't realize this. And so yeah. the yeah. reality is, like, no one's really thinking about you. Like, how are you going to stay healthy? And um, I was very inspired by the, the HIV community, where they were, like, they, they were activists. Like, they stood up, and they were angry, and they were demanding, like, we want to see progress in research. We want to see a cure. And I realized, like, I had that similar anger. Like, I want the, I want the world to focus on making me healthier. Like, I don't want to, like, be successfully treated with diabetes. Like, I just don't want it. So I kind of looked at that inspiration from the HIV community. as like, I want to be an activist brand. I want to inspire everyone to be an activist. And I'm going to leverage all of the social world that was, like, kind of just starting to flourish back in you know, that time frame, like 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm gonna mm -hmm. crowdsource research and cures and I'm gonna set up truly like a different type of healthcare system that is based on what's in your best interest. And so like everything that we do because of that now has been controversial because it's like not part of the system at, at all. And that was intentional from the very beginning is like, I wanna be entirely outside of the healthcare system. So, so let's talk a little bit about how 23andMe traditionally worked and in, in some of the new things you're doing, but let's, let's start with the, the foundations. I, I think uh, I discovered, uh, discovered y'all in like 2007. I believe I, I, I spit into a test tube, mailed it to you, and then answered a whole bunch of survey questions. And that seems like that's what I did for the first, I don't know, 10 years was, was, was mostly just was answer questions and find out things about myself. But talk about how you used what you learned there to move into some new areas, because I know that now you're not just telling people like, here's some information about your health, but you're, you're actively helping them make decisions uh, about ways that they could they can make changes in their lives, and now you're you're working uh, directly with uh, some drug discovery. Is that correct? I know you. Have, I think you have correct. two drugs in phase one. Is that is that right? Correct. Correct. Can, can you talk a little yeah, bit about how the, you got the, there? The mission. Yeah, I mean, the mission of the company was really about how do you help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. So there was absolutely this activist brand in me as like I want to I want to take control. And I realized like the healthcare world, 
like in some ways operates off a total lack of data. Like if you, um, people don't, like you go to the doctor, like you can, you can go and get second opinions in part because like no one really knows what's the right thing for you. And if you look at the drug discovery world, 90% of all medication, like all 90% of the pipelines fail. Like there's just failure all over the place. And so part of my point was like, if you want to really change healthcare, you have to get better data. Huh. Like I need data about what your risks are so you can prevent them. I need data about how human biology works so that you can intelligently design, you know, drugs with a human genetic foundation. And so the premise in the very beginning is like, if I get this data, I'm going to make all aspects of health better. And so the mission is like help people access, understand, and then benefit from the human genome. And so you talk about your experience, like the first phase of the company was how do I help you access your genetic information and then understand it? So I look at that as like all the things we did to pioneer online consent, just like dealing with, you know, the controversy around direct access and then the FDA authorizations. Like we went through the FDA and we proved out that you can actually understand your genome. And now when we think about benefit, it really is how do you actually use this information to execute on a healthier life? And I, in the back of my mind, it's always like, I want to be healthy at 100. So like, what are the steps that you need to do? And how do I have give you like truly personalized recommendations? So like today, healthcare is absolutely about the averages. Like, you know, one size fits all, everyone should yeah. get a mammogram at 50. Like, no, you shouldn't in the future. Like you should have something that's personalized. And on the medications, we've seen, I was like, if I, you know, people are eventually going to get sick. And so how is it that I can actually now develop therapeutics that are going to be eventually personalized to you, um, but are all starting with a human genetic foundation? And am I more likely to be successful because I'm starting with this genetic insight? And there's a lot of research that has now shown that if you start with a human genetic insight, you're more than twice as likely to be successful in drug discovery. So we feel like we have this opportunity to really drive efficiency in care and about like what's right for you, like truly personalize it. And then second, like really have a much more efficient drug discovery process. And it's, it's not just drug discovery either, right? You've, I, I know you, you acquired a company called Lemonade last year in, um, I believe right. in the fall and uh, are now working with them to work to work with people directly, right? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that yeah, program as well? Yeah, well what's interesting is that most you know, like most people all recognize that um, everyone's going to have genetic information that's part of their care in the future. Yeah. Like people talk about, like it's going to be like genetics is, has to be part of your care. It's like the fundamental part of you. Like it has to be part of your. So the human genome was sequenced mm -hmm. in 2003, you know, 2000, 2003, um, but it's still not part of your care. Like why is that? And Frankly, it's not because like, unlike the tech world where like, you know, a new chip comes out or a new technology, like, and it like immediately is disseminated for so many reasons, technology is often not adopted in healthcare. And so part of the reason why we acquired Lemonade was a little bit of this recognition that the existing healthcare world is not going to change and that we need to be a better bridge to that healthcare world. Meaning that if you get your genetic information, I need to help translate all of that to your primary care physician, to your specialist, and help them really understand what do you do with that genetic information. Because we heard from our customers over and over again that they're getting this information, but the medical world does not know what to do with it. And, and, and so now specifically, we're looking to be that source of information. And maybe you can, could you describe for our audience here a little bit about what Lemonade is and, and, and how that mm -hmm. relationship works? Yeah, Lemonade is a, um, is, a, is a phenomenal startup. They were one of the first um, you know, groups really providing telemedicine and pharmacy online. And what they have now, what they enable us to do is bring care in all, deliver care in all 50 states. And they, have an, they actually have their own pharmacy and they can deliver pharmacy. So we have this opportunity now to empower all of our customers, you know, over almost 13 million customers to get access to care, as well as potentially to order therapeutics through the Lemonade side. And so therapeutics was particularly interesting to me. Like I didn't wanna just do virtual care, but therapeutics in particular, because so many 
medications today have a genetic component. Like, especially look at things like mental health mm -hmm. and depression. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. many of those therapeutics have a genetic component, but it is not integrated. And largely, like, again, it's a pain point for me. Like, I think about depression, people just cycle on. You know, you take a medication, does it work? You cycle off onto another medication, you keep cycling. Yeah. And there are genetics associated with, you know, predicting what you're likely to respond to or not respond to. And it's not adopted because there's not necessarily a cost benefit for the healthcare system. And that's sort of a prime example that I often bring up. Oh, sorry, it's my mom. That's my mom. Oh. Talk about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell her, down, down one. Um, that is a prime example of how the healthcare system is often not necessarily operating what's your best interest. They're operating based on public health, like what's the best for the masses, like for, right. you know, the big, but not necessarily what's best for you. And that's where I'm a huge proponent of you having more of a voice about yourself because you might say, I'd really like to pay this extra money and just know what antidepressant is going to work for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of the people who are here today are entrepreneurs, innovators, and one of the things that we th thought might be interesting to ask you about was in 2013 when the FDA um, halted your work. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about how you responded to that and, and, and what it's like to go through that kind of adversity as a, you know, as a founder? I think, um, you know, I've always been, I always love feedback. Like I just heard, listened to this talk about from Adam Grant and he was talking about the importance of people cultivating, not necessarily getting all the positive feedback, but all the negative feedback. And so like I have always loved doing that. And I love engaging with people who disagree with me in one way or another. And I also love data. Like I love to argue with, like we've done research and we actually have data to support this. So when the FDA came, I mean, in some ways like this was the ultimate argument. <laughs> um, you know, I originally was dismissive. I was like, oh, the FDA, get, like we've gotten so many warning letters, like here's just one more. Um, and then when they made it public um, and some people called me and they're like, Anne, we know how you think and you better take this seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I think engineers have this mentality. Almost all problems are solvable. Like, it's just a matter of, like, you have to solve it. And so, in my mind, this was no different than, like, an engineering problem. Like, I had to solve it. And one thing I love to tell people in the company, like, when we started the company, gay marriage was illegal. And, obviously, it's not. So, the world can change. So, I totally recognize that, like, the FDA doesn't have necessarily this infrastructure or that direct-to-consumer is unusual or doctors don't believe that this can happen this way, but we're changing, like you can change the world, but the way you change the world is with persistence and also with data. So one thing I also like to cite people on, in 19, I think it was 68, there was a JAMA article that surveyed physicians and it asked them, would you tell your patient if they had cancer? If they had cancer. And 90% of physicians in that article said they would not tell their wow. patient the patient had cancer. Wow. So, like, the world is capable of changing. Like, clearly that's not the norm anymore. But, like, the world is capable of changing, and frankly, it's because of all of you and persistence that you change it. But it's hard. And, like, you can't see... Like, now, in some ways, it's almost, like, obvious. Like, when, when we started the company, it was so controversial that we did online consent. Like... It's like, like DocuSign and all of this is like totally the norm now. But like that was not the norm then. It was like super controversial. And so even the idea now of like consumer directed ordering, it's like totally normal. Like tons and tons of companies have started based on this hypothesis. But like it was not normal or accepted in any capacity then. So the world does change. And sometimes being first is hard. And the advice I always give to people is like, one, you have to focus on that long term. Like I knew... We were, like we used to say in house, we're like, we know we're on the right side of history, but you have to develop that data to support. And so what we did, like our strategy with the FDA was like, oh, you want us to prove that this is accurate and you want us to prove this is safe? Like, we're really good at getting data. And so we drowned them. We we're like, 
I think the average submission is, you know, hundreds of pages. And our first submission was, you know, thousands of pages. Like we're going to, we're going to show you, we can be, we're not just an A student, we're the A plus plus student. And so, um, you know, data wins a lot of arguments. It does. And thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thank you.